Let's welcome Mr. David Wallerstein. Let's talk about the human future. Our Earth is changing rapidly, as we all know. Oh, I need to find this. This year, in fact, the past few months have been really extraordinary on our planet. It seemed like the once every hundred year event was happening day after day, uh, especially in the United States, where I'm from, Florida, Texas, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, even Ireland had a hurricane. When you see these things at home, we, we care for these people that we see far away, but somehow it still feels a little bit far away from us. We hear about climate change, but unless we personally experience it, it seems like kind of a theory or something that is far off. And even though I personally work in this area, sometimes I have that feeling too. But something happened to me, me personally, a few weeks ago. I, I'm, I grew up in a town about one hour north of San Francisco. Has anyone here visited San Francisco before? Can I see a hand? About half of you. About one hour north is the wine country, a beautiful part of the world. And my hometown caught on fire. It's been drier in California than almost any time in the history of California. Hot days and big winds, 70 mile per hour winds rushing through our town. And uh, fire caught, we think it's from power lines, and that fire spread through the town so rapidly we couldn't control it. With all of our modern technology in America, could not control it. And 42 people died right in California recently. And when you see this happen to your own hometown, it makes you feel like the things that you thought would happen in the future are, are happening right now. So it's very important more than ever, oh, this is what my hometown is now looking like, many, many parts of, this, uh, of my town. It's, it's just so striking when you see a beautiful neighborhood look like that. So that's why what I really want to talk to you today is how do we all start developing what I want to call a planetary scale perspective, PSP. We're really good at thinking about ourselves. We think about our jobs, think about having a good time tonight, some of you may be thinking about lunch or dinner. That's the individual perspective. That's me, my friends. Some of us also think about our cities, Beijing. How do we improve Beijing or China? But what's very hard for most of us, even myself, is how do you actually envision what's happening on the planet in real time, in your everyday life? But there's so much power to be able to do this. And what I want to do today is talk to you about how we can all do this, everyone in this room, because it's so easy when you just ask simple questions. It really starts by just asking a question. Because we're so fortunate that we have brilliant natural scientists on our planet now, in China and around the world, that are asking these questions every day. And we, when we start to ask those questions, we can get amazing answers. So I want to show you a few examples, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Let's, for example, just think about an area like climate change, like what I was just talking about. I'm sure many of you have seen the data on climate change, and you've seen breakdowns like this. There's a power, though, in going a few steps deeper. So you see uh, this kind of graph here and how the, the causes, uh, the sources of greenhouse gases can be allocated to industry, transportation, agriculture. But then you can go a step deeper. Let's take agriculture, for example. And if you go a little step deeper into agriculture, you might find something that we'd all find fascinating. A lot of that's from cows. About 10% of our planet's greenhouse gases come just from one animal, which is, for some of you, dinner or lunch, right? Who wants to have a hamburger, huh? Well, when you want that hamburger, you better be responsible for it because it's 10% of our greenhouse gases. And when you see data like this, it can raise these types of questions. It empowers us to say, is that right? Maybe I should have something else for dinner. Let's do another example. Let's just say you had a question, and by the way, this is exactly what I did for this presentation. I just asked a question that I wanted to show you, and I went online, and soon enough, I had data, and I'm sharing it with you now. How is Earth's land allocated? Well, about 71% of the surface of Earth is the oceans, and 29% is land. So on this big planet, we only have that much land. And you can go deeper. Okay, 
How is Earth's land allocated? About 71% of it, we can live on. It's habitable. And the rest, we would consider unhabitable because it's like next to a volcano or something. Now let's look into that. What are the habitable lands like? And about 50% of them are agriculture. So that's to feed us. We've got a big portion that's for force. Then there's this other category, deserts. What's that little strip down the middle? Well, that's really important to everyone in this room because those are the urban environments. So basically, 60% of human beings on planet Earth are living in this little 1% strip. It's fascinating, isn't it? That's how we've decided to allocate our lives. There's a power to identifying this because you can start asking why, and then you can start thinking, how can we do things better? But let me go a little bit deeper into this. So let's look at that big section of agriculture. How's that allocated? Again, very interesting. 77% of that is for those cows that we were talking about. Now, the 23% are all the crops, all the veggies, all that wheat and grains and rice. And that food needs to feed both the animals and us, right? So when you see this data, you start asking, why? Why is that the case? And let's go a step further. Let's do a planetary scale question again and say, where do the human produced calories from Earth come from? All together, every calorie that we produce. And only about 17% of the calories come from meat and dairy. So you say, wow, so much land is going towards so much, so little calories, energy, right? So guys, I hope you're enjoying that hamburger. You know, enjoy. But there's a cost to it, right? You have to recognize that. I want to apply one more perspective here. And I'll stick to the theme of animals. It's kind of fun when you talk about it. This is just, this is just what's happening, right? OK. Let's ask about the aggregation of life on Earth. Us human beings, I had to update the slide because we're just almost like 7.6 billion. We're like 7.58 or something billion right now. Then to the right, that bigger circle are the animals. That's our food. That's your food right there, OK? That's dinner. And if you break it down, there's about 20 billion chickens, all these sheep, all these cattle, all these pigs. Who here loves dogs? Any dog lovers? I see a few hands. Oh, OK. That's actually proportional to this, uh, 7.6 billion humans and about 500 million dogs. I want to show it to you. Is it going to respond? It is. Good. OK. Does anyone see a little dot on that page? I guess you have to look here behind me. Do you see a little dot? That dot represents a vast majority of the very exciting wild mammals on our planet. It's about 1.2 million of them in a certain category. It's not every single mammal, but we assembled uh, the data we could find. What this is showing you is that if you are not our food or you are not our pet, you're almost gone. Everything, almost extinct, OK? There's like 3,000 tigers left. Some people say I'm like a tiger. I'm a tough guy. Maybe in 15 years, a young person doesn't even know what you're talking about if the tigers aren't here anymore. We have to revise the Chinese astrology. <laughs> Something like that. So humans, everyone, human beings in here, we are responsible for life on Earth. And I'm not even talking about insects. Recently, there's a study showing that huge amounts of insects are being lost globally. And so whether we know it or not, whether we understand what we're doing or not, humans are responsible on Earth. Okay? Here's the promise, though, is we have never been in a better time in history to leverage innovations to solving our challenges. And that's what I want to talk about. We need to make Earth more resilient. We basically need to take our planet back and re-architect our lives more successfully, more intelligently. This is how we're doing it at Tencent. Now I'm going to show you some very specific examples, and particularly my job as the CXO. We looked for the most exciting human innovations in the world. Artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, AI, quantum computing. And we try to target those technologies very specifically at global challenges. I'm going to show you four different examples of companies that we're working with that enable us to do that today. So we just talked about Earth data. When we understand what's happening in the planet in real time, it, Earth data can, can become a completely new platform for informing 
many decisions on earth, in industries and, and maybe new types of businesses, a government. When you know what's happening, you can not only ask a bigger question, but you can make a smarter decision. It used to be that satellites would cost hundreds of millions of dollars and would be huge and you'd have to get them on a big rocket and it would take a long time to build. But with advances in electronics in many areas, and as we've been hearing today, in fact, we can now build light and powerful satellites that enable us to build constellations around the Earth that can tell us in real time what's happening on our planet. And we're working with uh, companies like uh, Planet and Satellogic to uh, explore the boundaries of how this can actually help us redefine our world and the way we make decisions. We also work with a wonderful company called Zenesis that ingests data for developing countries, in particular like Ethiopia, where now they can look at vast amounts of data and help those governments decide how can they allocate resources more efficiently, make smarter decisions, and make sure that with the, the most, uh, least amount of resources possible, they're allocating it to the best possible purpose. Let's take another area now, energy and transportation. Most people that got here today probably sat in some traffic, and we know traffic is absolutely terrible. At the same time, our modern transportation infrastructure uses fuel, which creates a huge amount of greenhouse gases. In fact, uh, it's about 15, 14 to 22% of greenhouse gases. And at the same time, we know transportation uh, is about, in the United States, it's 9% of GDP. It's a big part of GDP. How can we both solve the problem with greenhouse gases as well as reduce congestion at the same time? Especially when we know that we're only uh, aggregating ourselves on that little 1% strip of land, if we continue to do that. We're very excited to be working with a company called Lilium that makes what we call an electrical vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. You can see it here. The future is coming very soon, guys. It's just around the corner. When you have this kind of vehicle with 300 kilometers of range and about a 300 kilometer speed, it totally reinvents the relationship between cities in a region. People here in this room could be living in Hebei at a farm, wake up in the morning, maybe feed your cow, put on your suit and your tie, wait for the VTOL, the eVTOL to pick you up and transport you to the top of the highest building in, in Beijing, the apex of power. You'll be there with your suit, you'll get out and you'll start making your phone calls and then when it's time to go home, you'll get back in your EV tall and fly back to your farm, put your hand in the dirt, feed a couple more cows, and ready for the next day. Hebei, Tianjin, these areas can now become part of a, an integrated region. And it's so exciting to think about how we could actually both empower ourselves to not have to deal with traffic every day, but spread ourselves around. So we're very, very excited about this technology. Let's talk about the third area. Human health is obvious. This is the the essence of our lives. We have to live healthy lives as long as possible and as healthy as possible. There's some incredible advances in next generation sequencing and genetic engineering that have the potential to totally redefine human health. We're very excited to be working with a company called Carius that with a sample of blood can tell you if you have an infection. And there's all kinds of infections on Earth. In some cases, someone will get sick and you don't know what it is. Is it Zika? Is it Ebola? Something like this. And, and time is of the essence when you have an infection, depending how serious it is, of course. With this case, you just do one test, and it can tell you if you have more than 1,200 uh, uh, pathogens in your body just by looking at the cell-free DNA. Of course, combined with the artificial intelligence capabilities to understand the data. It's very, very exciting. We know cancer is probably one of the most concerning diseases for all of us here. And there's companies now, similar to Carius, with a sample of blood, can look at the circular tumor DNA and identify the presence of cancer in your body. And before too long, we're going to be able to discover the presence of cancer in your body as early as possible without having any symptoms, no lumps, no things that happen when you have cancer. And the earlier you can detect it, that saves lives. I think one of our speakers will be talking about that pretty soon. Finally, food security. I've been talking about food a little bit. The pressure is immense. We're going to grow another billion people on the planet in 12 years. Right? Just think about that. 
how are we going to feed ourselves? We've got agriculture, land is under pressure. We have water shortages. Sometimes we have floods. That also can destroy an agriculture region. We have problems with fertilizer, insecticides. It goes on and on and on. And remember that graph I was showing you? 7.6 billion humans and 24 billion animals? What's the relationship there? Well, if you grow another billion, how many more animals do we need? And how much more food do we need to feed the animals? We're going to have to do much more with less if we're going to pull this off. Well, we're extremely excited to be working with a company called Phytech that uses a variety of sensors in a field, as well as satellite data, powered by machine learning, to understand the situation of your plants. They're optimizing plant health. And what they do that's really cool, exciting for me, is they put sensors right on the plant. And the plant will actually have behavior. It, it'll vasculate. Like when it's, it's healthy, it'll breathe properly, like a heartbeat. And so you can have these sensors spread throughout a field, and you can know very precisely how much water you need to apply, how many, what kind of nutrients do you need to apply. They find, on average, that their clients are saving 20% water and having 20% more productivity. That's the kind of solution that we're going to need to be introducing to the world again and again and again. And each one becomes a new level, and we build off that new level, that new foundation. And we have to keep going, probably for the rest of human history. So we're going to have to get good at this. So we're doing a lot of investing. In addition, we're working with scientists, researchers around the world, different kinds of programmers, uh, programs to do that. We're working with international organizations. I've had some opportunities uh, to speak at the UN earlier this year, which is always fun. It's becoming fun. Um, raising public awareness. We believe events like this are really important, like the WE Summit, to highlight the science uh, that's being done, the good work being done, and to encourage others to go into this area. So I want to leave you with a request and a recommendation that I think particularly the people that come to the WE Summit and the people that uh, watch the WE Summit are inclined to want to figure out what are the new opportunities to apply technology to solve our world's problems. And I think the role of everyone in this room and everyone watching and everyone who cares is so important. We can't just always think that it's happening to someone else or that someone else will solve the problem. What about you? Do you care? Do you want to try to solve the problem? And it can just start by asking the question, what are you passionate about? What thing on earth is puzzling to you? Because I guarantee you, when you ask that question, the answers are just around the corner. And when you find the answers, you may be shocked. And in there may be the biggest business opportunity of your lifetime. But you'll be tackling that business while making the planet a healthier place. That's the kind of business that I want to be in. I think we all want to be in that business, right? Yep. OK. So let's do it, guys. Let's do it together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.